Yeah, my, my experience and uh, research in genocide has uh, focused on testimonies and, and the symbolization uh, and the linguistic markers that sort of precede genocidal conditions, 10 criterion that sort of are the precursors or the characteristics of a genocide, you know, creating a them versus us, you know, hate speech, name calling, you know, words like agent, agents, mm. foreign agents. You know, these are terms that we've seen in the testimonies that are emerging from the detention camp in Turkey. Before there's a physical genocide, there's always a cultural and a symbolic genocide. Obviously, persecution, extermination, and uh, in, in most cases, denial. Denial would be sort of when, when these things are denied, uh, then uh, these are sort of the, the, the clear-cut indicators of, of a genocidal uh, situation. Uh, that the countries that the detainees in Turkey uh, are facing, they come from countries that are at the emergency level, especially when you talk mm-hmm. about a country like Turkey, you talk about a country like Iran, uh, they've already shown especially the letters uh, and the speeches that came out of the UN uh, confirmed this, that there are conditions uh, for ethnic and religious minorities are quite frankly, you know, at the, at the warning level of, of the genocidal indicators, proofs of all these different characteristics in, in all the testimonies. Uh, one example that really uh, struck me was the letter from a 10-year-old girl named Mariam, yes. uh, which I'm sure everybody has watched. Look at the handwriting, look at the words that, you know, hear the words that she's saying. Uh, you know, th- she talks about her mother and her being separated from, from their father, uh, being in, in um, atrocious conditions. I mean, I mean if, I, if I remember correctly, uh, she talks about the toilets being disgusting. Yes. Uh, she talks about you know, sleeping on the floor, uh, only being let out one hour a day in the sunlight. I mean, these are, these are horrific conditions that even, even humane prisons don't have these types of conditions, uh, let alone uh, people who are innocent of any crime. Alhamdulillah, this is being recognized and uh, the word is spreading. Uh, of course, there's still a lot to be done. Yes. Uh, but but this is this is something that is very critical and it's at a critical level. Uh, the moment of truth for Turkey is arriving, has arrived, uh, and uh, this goes back to uh, even their recent history of denying uh, what they did to the Armenians. You know, denial is is probably the you know the icing on the cake when it comes to the genocide indicators. <laughs> In this day and age, when everything is being live streamed and recorded, which we've talked about a lot as being the key to the protection, I mean, the conditions would be definitely worse um, because we don't want to act after the body bags are flown in front of us. I mean, that's too late. Absolutely. Um, And you say it looks not even like a prison. And the word that were coming into my mind was it was it it looks like a a concentration camp. It is later is very similar uh, horrifically to to the Anne Frank uh, letters and and, uh, notes of her famous or unfamous uh, journal. When when a nation or an empire is dying and, and feels threatened, and they feel like their identity is is being lost. Uh, that's when they tend to go towards these types of practices. Uh, so there's some there's some insecurity psychologically, civilization that's happening. I mean, this is this is obviously a low point uh, of of a, of, a, of a disintegrating nation state or empire that uh, ends up doing things like this. So we can we find that. Uh, a lot of the Muslim world, uh, Muslim majority land, you know, they've, they've sort of been in this condition for a long time. Uh, and that's why it's hard for them to practice transparency, authenticity, mm. freedom of speech, mm. you know, freedom of expression, freedom of thought. I mean, they haven't had, they've been authoritarian dictatorships for a lo- very long time. Yes. And a lot of that is rooted in their understanding of religion, you know, so they use religion to to create this type of atmosphere. And so when a religion rises that challenges the fun fundamentals of that, 
uh, that has to be squashed. That has to be removed. I find it remarkable that uh, we find that in Europe, the sentiment of never again uh, came up and it was uh, lauded and it was upheld. Uh, and you find that that kind of understanding exists. And that's why we find that there are human rights today that perhaps were not seen some years ago or uh, decades ago. But then you find that this understanding just doesn't exist in the Middle East, unfortunately. And especially we see right now with Turkey, the way it's treating these detained people, these detained members. Um, it's really sad because you'd hope that a country that that says that it's Islamic or a Muslim state would understand that we should be the ones who hold up never again, not the Europeans or the European Union. However, we find it to be the other way around. Uh, it says a lot, I think, about the Middle East right now and the understanding of Islam today. That's completely corrupt. Uh, and so you have to question, you know, what their interpretation or what their understanding of religion is, mm. uh, in particular, what their understanding of Islam is. I mean, in the case of uh, Iran, for example, you know, Baha'is can't go to universities, cannot go to colleges. My goodness. And, uh, you know, so um, these types of actions show weakness. You know, they're in sort of these conditions that Maryam is talking about because why? I mean, because you know, she's separated from her father, you know, and she can't see him. I mean, what, what's, what's their crime? You know, uh, and, you know, Turkey and all Muslim nations that, that are seeing this uh, will have to, uh, will have to answer to this in their own conscience and before the world.